I live with my wife in the New England countryside, and the honeybees near our house have been acting strange lately. We were new to this neck of the woods, still settling in after surrendering our loud city lives for one of quiet solitude, and hopefully kids, as we entered middle age. We both worked from home, so finding the perfect house, one where we could lay roots and watch each other turn grey, was important. The search seemed endless. Our realtor sent us houses. We looked, we passed. Too big, too small, too ugly, too something. Then we saw the farm, the one resting in the countryside just north of Briar Ridge, a cosy town in Massachusetts that belonged on a postcard or in a snow globe. It was perfect. Sprawling fields, dense woods, lots of space and fresh air, an overdose of Mother Nature, which is exactly what we needed. The price wasn't a walk-away steal, but the good things in life never are. We moved in three months ago, and, for a while, things were as they should be. Totally, absolutely, utterly perfect. Then, Carmen got the bees. Honeybees were a staple of the landscape, bobbing from flower to flower, hind legs fat with pollen as they went about their busy days. She had always wanted a hive of her own, one to tend and nurture, one from which we could draw honey fresh from the comb. In our old townhouse, that had been an impossibility, but with all this open space, she ordered them online from Solid Bees, which, unsurprisingly, does not exist. I sometimes wonder, after all that's happened, where they really came from. I guess I'll never know for certain. So that was how my wife became a beekeeper. My lovely, gorgeous wife, still stunning at 38, with curly black hair, kept short, and emerald green eyes. Carmen, the girl I loved, who went for a hike one day, and didn't return. It started before that, so far as I know, or tell, with a dead bird, one that had bloodily snapped its neck on our garden green hose. This story, like some, but not all, starts with blood. That's how it ends, too. The grassy field behind our house was huge. It wandered off in both ways before a wall of forest caught it and fenced it in. We had a garden, with flowers and fruits planted in neat rows, a giant red barn, and a greenhouse, one that was meant to cultivate vegetables. If I could get the indoor sprinkler system working, that was. I was toying with it when I noticed the red smear paint on the glassy wall, a few stray feathers clinging to it like gruesome ornaments. I peered through the fogged window and saw something moving on the ground beneath it. What the fuck? I padded outside and circled the glassy cube, peering first at the gory imprint, then at the squirming, writhing, something on the ground beneath it. A sickening buzz filtered off it, the sound of a drill devouring your teeth at the dentist. I realised, with a sudden pang of disgust, that it was a dead bird, one completely engulfed in honeybees. They clamoured over its limp, lifeless form, some taking off with little shreds of gore still dangling from their legs, more landing every second, piling on in thick, shifting layers. My stomach curled with nausea. I was never the queasy type, but something about it made me feel dirty. It was wrong. It was unholy. Bees weren't supposed to do that. Were they? Come, I called, directing my voice at the screened-in porch that filled out the back of our two-story farmhouse. She was drinking iced tea and rocking in the chair. Come here. What is it? She called back. I swallowed. I wasn't sure what it was. I just knew it felt wrong. The bees, I replied. I wasn't sure what else to say. The bees. She set down her glass and approached, a frown creasing her face as she saw the shifting bundle at my feet. What the? Is that normal? 
I asked, trying to keep my voice calm. <laughs> no, it's... She started, shaking her head. If they were vulture bees, yes, but they're not. She frowned again, uneasy. Should we do something? I asked, hoping she would say no. Um... Her frown creased further. Not in the books, huh? I asked, trying to lighten the situation. Our coffee table had been a mess of beekeeping books ever since she got in the hive. Uh, maybe we should go in, she said, sounding unnerved. I was relieved. I'd been afraid she was going to ask me to, I don't know, bury it or something. I was glad when she took my hand and pulled me towards the house. It was a relief when that sickening buzz finally surrendered my mind. But sometimes... Most times, I swore I could still hear it, especially when the noise of the world drew away, the buzzing of the bees. I awoke with a start, sheets damp, brow dabbled in sweat, to the sound of buzzing. It was deep, deafening, a dreadful white noise that seemed to burrow through my mind like a bee, hot needle. I looked out the bedroom window. Darkness looked back. It was late. 3.33 read the bedside LED. I sighed and reached over for a glass of water, hoping a healthy swig would burn away the noise. I had been hearing the buzzing on and off since the bird. It was dreadful, like the low ringing of tinnitus that seems bent on stealing your sanity. As I gripped the water glass, something landed on my hand. I looked at it for a moment, squinting in the gloom. It was a honeybee. It trundled up the crook of my thumb and settled on my wrist. What the fuck? What's a honeybee doing in... With sudden fury, its body trembled, its back coiled, and it plunged its stinger into my flesh. I let out a surprised cry as a bolt of pain clipped up my arm. I shook off the dead bee, its gutted body trailing white viscera. I could see more swirling through the air, a dreadful tornado orbiting her. I turned, slowly, my heart beating at the walls of my ribs, my breath hot and ragged, soaring through my lungs. A cold, throbbing dread swallowed me whole as I turned to face my wife. The sight of her was visceral. It slugged me through the gut and nearly folded me over. I felt a sour run of bile force its way up my throat. Carmen was drenched in bees, a human hive of insects, her skin writhing and squirming with hundreds, thousands of them, that thick, Hot buzzing piped off one steady drone. It filled the whole room and needled at my teeth. It made me want to scream. I almost did, but stopped myself, afraid that if I screamed, it wouldn't be a scream at all. It would be a buzz. Carmen's eyes opened through the mask of insects, eyes filled with fear and pain and silent pleading. The eyes of a hostage in a terrorist video. She opened her mouth and bees poured out with a choked gurgle. I tried to move, to reach out for her, and found I couldn't. My limbs were numb, tingling with the white static of fear. There was a noise above the bed. A low hiss filtered into the buzz. My head slowly rose to the ceiling, neck creaking like a rusty door. I felt my bladder go loose, sending a warm, comforting trickle running down my leg. The bedroom ceiling was one massive hive, a crooked nest of hideous, hexagonal holes alive with insects. Directly above us, the hive swelled up into an ugly, waxen mound like an anthill, a mound topped by a distended black mouth, a human mouth, one torn into a scream. The hissing built louder, loud, and it was coming from the mouth. A thick stream of bees exploded out of it like cement from a dump truck, drenching me in hot, moving insects. 
The great buzz filled my brain, flooding it with insane noise that would never leave. No, I was certain of that. This was a buzz that would nest in my neurons and synapses, one that would lay eggs and lurk just behind my thoughts and feelings like hellish elevator music. I opened my mouth to scream, to scream for my very sanity. I scraped the pit of my soul, channeling all my terror and disgust and agony into one loud buzz. I awoke with a sudden cry, my wife's hand on my sweaty arm. I looked at her and she looked back. No bees tunneling up her nose and ears, none combing through her curly black hair. It was a dream, but I could still hear it. Fading, yes, but still there. The buzzing of the bees. It vibrated at the tip of my fingernails and eyelashes. It hid in the background, just low enough that I couldn't prove its existence. I told Carmen I was fine. Bad dream is all. I didn't expand. How could I? It was a dream. It was just a... Pain radiated up my wrist, fading into a dull throb at my shoulder. Like someone had buried a live wire in the meat beneath my skin. As Carmen rolled over and her breath leveled off into a soft, steady snore, I raised my arm into a shaft of moonlight. There was a red bump on my wrist, one that looked astonishingly like a bee sting. Alan! Carmen called from the porch. Come look at this! Her voice, usually calm and leveled, was trembling slightly. I was reading in the sunroom, and the sound of her shaky voice, laced through with fear? Confusion. Had me in motion before I could respond. That horrific dream came back to me. The one I'd had nearly two weeks before, in startling clarity. I could almost feel bees crawling over my skin and dragging their hot bodies through my hair as I padded over to the screen door. My wife stood on the porch in her beekeeper's suit, holding a tablet of black sludge. It dripped slowly, sickingly onto the porch, like she had exhumed a slab of tar from the bowels of the prehistoric period. Fat bees clawed at her helmet, buzzed around her shoulders, rattled at the screen door. I had come to hate those bees, an opinion I would never voice to my wife. Ever since I'd seen them swallowing that dead bird, and my dreams. The sight of them made my skin crawl, the sound of them. I swallowed my disgust. What is it? I asked, frowning. She looked up at me, eyes wide and confused, her face like a small child frightened by something they're too young to understand. It's the hive, she said. I... it doesn't make sense, Alan. It's all black. All of it. I looked at the thing in her hands and realised it was a black hive. Bees writhed out of it. Hallish disgusting bees, ones that buzzed and devoured birds. Sludged, dripped down in vicious, pitch-coloured sheets, sludge that smelled foul, like dead things. I looked from my wife's face to that rotten hive. For the first time in a while, I couldn't find my voice. We decided to call someone in from the city, a bee expert, a layman might say. To come take a look, to tell us what the fuck was wrong with Carmen's hive. It was a Friday, and they wouldn't be able to make it out to the sticks until next week. Not that it mattered. She found me in the study the day after the incident, and said, without emotion or expression, they're all gone. I followed her outside, and saw she was right. The beehive was completely empty. The white box the one usually rattling with noise, was as silent as the wood it was made out of. She lifted the hive trays, showing me sticky, black slabs of honeycomb, each of them empty, silent, devoid of life. A part of me was relieved. Hell, all of me was. But 
the little voice in my head was a trifle uneasy. It was a weird phenomena, eerie, like the sky raining frogs. Something about it felt wrong. But they were gone, and that meant the buzzing dreams and black sludge would be a thing of history, or so I hoped. My wife fell into a mood, and it was not a good one. She was quiet, apathetic, chased by her own private thunderstorm that clouded out the sunshine she normally radiated in spades. She moped around, shuffling between the computer, which was open to web searches about missing bees, like she might put their picture on a milk carton with a reward, and the empty hive. The bees didn't return, they didn't pollinate the flowers, they didn't float through the air on important business. Carmen's honeybees had vanished, and they never came home. Things got better, slowly, yes, but better. There were a few good solid weeks where we lived like people in a dream, drifting through a strange, underwater world where the possibility of good things, of things turning out alright, was not just a possibility, but a guarantee. If you had asked me then, in the weeks where not a single bee pollinated the flowers behind our house, how I saw things turning out, I would have told you a rose-coloured fairy tale with a happy ending, one where a couple grows old, has dogs and kids, and watches the sun set from the porch, watches it until it sets for the last time on both of their lives. But life isn't a fairy tale. It's a monster hiding behind the good things. The ones that don't come every day. So, when they do, you cling on to them with an edict that says, This is why I live. I didn't know that Saturday would change my life. And I didn't know it would be the last good morning I'd ever have. It had been a month or so since the bees had vanished when Carmen told me she was going to take a short hike through the woods. Her eyes were bright and eager, the eyes of the woman I loved. She was back. I kissed her goodbye, told her I loved her, never saw her alive again. By one in the afternoon, I was getting worried. She had been gone for nearly four hours, and her phone was right where she left it, on the kitchen counter. I paced, rubbed at my eyes, pulled at my hair, and smoked on the porch as two o'clock came and went. Now I was getting scared. Something was wrong. Something was definitely wrong. I decided to go after her. The hiking trail was disused, mostly overgrown. A thin path of flattened dirt winding through the densely packed woods. The shadows were pulling long. The sky was bleeding a sunset. It was getting late, and, worst of all, no sign of Carmen. I wandered for a while, calling her name, scanning the woods. Nothing. Nothing until... Bodies. I saw the first one resting in the weeds ten feet from the trail. A rotting rib cage jutting up through the growth. Flies crawled over it. No, not flies. Bees. There was another corpse just past it. A devoured deer, mostly decomposed. The air above it, a swirl with bees. I didn't see them. My eyes were pinned on one thing. The scrap of blue fabric clinging to one cracked antler like a marker. It was a piece of the shirt my wife had been wearing when she left. It snapped in the breeze, beckoning me as if to say, Carmen was here. Without hesitation, I cut off the trail and waded off into the low brush. The smell of corruption hit me almost instantly. A foul, earthy reek that tunnelled up my nose and brought water to my eyes. But that wasn't the worst of it. Laced into stench, barely discernible, was a different smell. One I recognised immediately. The smell of the black beehive. I continued past the dead animals, noticing more scattered throughout the woods. Deer, small critters, birds, devoured corpses funneling off the smell of death. 
Small knots of bees hung in the air above them like gruesome asteroid belts. I could hear the buzzing now, faint, getting louder, louder, coming from, coming from behind that dense wall of growth, snarls of brush and trees interwoven into an impenetrable fortress. I moved closer, cupping my shirt to my mouth to help with the smell. Bees landed on my shirt. They clawed through my hair. A few stung me, but I didn't feel it. My eyes were set on that wall of growth. I fought my way closer, navigating up a ladder of roots, before finally shoving my body sideways through a gap in the trunks. I had to shuffle, two massive trees crushing in on both sides, more bees landing every second. I pushed harder, planting my feet, grinding my body, finally shoving into a wall of noise filled the world. The deep, ear-splitting buzz I'd come to dread forced out everything else. It was a noise I could smell and taste and feel shaking in my bones. I was in a foul clearing. I was in death's valley. Mountains of black, sludgy beehive rose around me crudely pasted over a wide clearing to form a dreadful embrace of countless hexagonal holes. The nest rose and fell in misshapen columns, all of it moving with a liquid-like layer of bees. Dead things were scattered about, encased in blackish wax like insects trapped in amber. Skeletons, still ripe with rotting flesh, decorated the nightmarish display at every turn. The smell was unbearable, a smell to drive one from their sanity. It filled my lungs like scum water. It made me want to die. Those thoughts fled when I saw the centerpiece, a wide display spread across from me, their queen, strung up on a vertical wall of hive. It was my wife, Carmen. She was a blackened, ruined effigy, a hideous parody of the human being. She was nude, her mouth and eyes, both wide in silent fright, were filled with bees. A thick stream flowed down her throat and squirming knots filled her empty eyes. I could feel them stinging me. Flashes of pain clipped up from my arms, neck, legs. I was wearing a suit of stingers. I opened my mouth and screamed. It was all I could do. I screamed. A bee landed in my mouth, stung my tongue. More fell in after it. I gagged and turned, clawing my hair, shoulders, arms, as more bees fell on me in a dizzying cloud. I planted my feet and forced my body out of there. I forced it away, because if I didn't, I would lose myself. Not just my physical life, but the purity of whatever comes next. I fell out of the clearing and ran. Ran until I could run no more. Ran as bees stung me, as my lungs filled with dreadful fluid, as the buzz drilled through my head and settled into my ears with a low steady hum. I found myself behind our house with the stars high and bright and the moon watching in judgement. I staggered inside and drank, drank until the pain fell away and the buzzing left my mind, or was bandaged by the warm embrace of whiskey. Then I started to write because, well, I don't know why. I thought it might clarify things. I was wrong. So, here I am, a dozen bottles lined up neatly, each filled with lighter fluid and a rag, a box of matches at the ready. I want to go out there and burn it all down. I need to, but I'm not sure I can. I'm afraid, not of death, but of what it sounds like on the other side. I'm afraid that if it ends, I'll be in a black place with nothing but noise. Nothing but the buzzing of the bees. Thank you guys, ghouls and girls for watching. Please feel free to connect with me on my Discord server, and if you want to watch me live, check out my Twitch channel. 
I am very active on both platforms and even have scheduled streams. I would absolutely love to see you there. Links to my other social media platforms are in the description below. Stay, 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 stay.